Hi, Joachim. I'm super grateful and happy to have you as a guest in the Leadership Genius Leadership Podcast. Thank you, Anna. I'm I'm, I'm happy to be here. This is sort of a I never done a leadership interview before, so uh, this is uh, it's going to be fun. Oh, really? You haven't? I, I just feel like you you are in this position for quite a while already, and you're doing a lot of great great things with the Crunchfish. I think I've I've been in panel discussions actually, but I, I don't think I've been interviewed on leadership in this uh, way. But I've uh, I know I've sat in leadership panels uh, to yeah, but uh, no, I don't think I have been a you know uh, this much in the spotlight to try to answer leadership questions. It's going to be fun. Yeah, it will be, and happy premiere then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. So I usually uh, start with the question of what is leadership to you and who is a leader? Oh, uh, big questions. Uh, what is leadership? Um, I, I think it is um, leadership is, uh, I guess, to um, I'm, I'm quite personally quite results oriented. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a little bit to get something achieved uh, and uh, and uh, point in that direction. Um, getting other people engaged, uh, interested in uh, what you want to achieve um, and getting the commitment, um, serving others uh, in that uh, work that you, uh, you know, really, really sort of uh, be there, uh, but also uh, sort of be there and point the way uh, for everybody to, uh, to uh, get, you know, move people from A to B or, you know, do, do a task from A to B. It's, it's, it's all about, uh, being quite clear about what, what's uh, what's going to happen and uh, trying to engage uh, and then get people to uh, sort of follow. Mm-hmm. What was your other question? You had you had two, didn't you? And who is the leader? So th- that's kind of the same thing, right? What is the leadership and who is the leader? But I think you kind of answered both in yeah, your answer okay. already. Yeah, yeah. So it's both about being a visionary and keeping tapping into your goal as you, uh, you called it result but then at the same time be this captain who is supporting the whole crew on the on the on the way and make sure that everyone is still on board and not in the sea <laughs> yeah no I, I think it's leadership is a lot about uh it's a lot about caring uh it's a lot about uh, uh sort of being a bit, bit of a captain on, on the ship sort of the, the captain leaves the the ship last if something happens and it's sort of it's, it's, it's about to stand up for uh the whole journey and uh, and and be there for everybody and uh, and and also sort of be be sort of um, yeah pointing out the direction. I think it's important to 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 be a leader. Uh, otherwise, you tend to be more of a follower, which is also a very important role to be. But uh, if you talk about leadership, I think it's it's, it's a lot about to uh, set directions. I think. Oh yeah. So yeah, as a leader, you need to have your feet in a lot of different shoes and like switch between them like being the leader or like being the captain showing the direction and also being the follower to be in the other shoes and so on that's fascinating how do you make sure that you are being sustainable with like being this person who is leaving the ship last because it means that you need to put a lot of effort into what you're doing at crunchfish uh, as a team uh, you're also responsible for in front, in front of your stakeholders and shareholders. And how do you make sure that it all goes in a healthy way, both for you and your team? Um, in, in terms of sort of leadership in that, I think, I think there are mo- moments of truth uh, that happens all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it's, it's all about to uh, be authentic and uh, you... Um, you, you basically it's not what you say it's what you do which which is important and and you you there are so many opportunities to prove yourself all the time that you are a, a person to be relied on uh that uh, they know you're there uh, you know as uh, we chat a little bit before this call and i was telling you if, if someone leaves the company I, I i tend to buy them a cake uh not that, that i want to want them to leave but uh this is sort of a, a little bit sensitive yeah it is a sensitive situation for them but uh, i'm celebrating them in a way uh, because uh i think we have a great work environment here but uh if they leave uh they must have found something better than than being here uh and for their sake it's worth celebrating mm-hmm. uh so it, it's sort of lo- looking at what they you know look at seeing them and then being in their shoes and uh 
and uh, you know they, they they will leave anyway, won't they? Uh, and it's much better than to. And that's a moment of truth uh, to uh, deliver on in that situation as a leader. Um, so that's that, that that's just one example. But but that, it happens every day. There is always things come up, and uh, it, it it is all about being that uh, person who's there, who's present, authentic, uh, empath empath uh, well, well with empathy. It's, it's all these things, uh, and so there's so many. It happens all the time that you prove yourself, I, uh, and uh, you know how it is that you you can do have one bad moment, and it probably takes ten good ones to make up for that one. So uh, you know, as a leader, the more you can be balanced and uh, and, and and sort of supportive, uh, the better I think is for the whole journey. Really, people will trust you and uh, want to work with you and follow you. Or yeah, I think that's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely important. Could you give a couple of examples of the situations where you have a chance and you show your empathy, you show how you're present, where you show how you walk the talk for your employees? Because I think that this is very helpful for our audience to just get another perspective maybe, or yet another example of, ah, I can actually do like this as well. And broaden. Yeah, I think the, I, I like the cake example that when people leave, uh, th think of uh, just, um, Th th that is a good example for, for doing all these these things sort of but but it, but it could be um, it, it happens things you know when um, you know uh, people it happens to people things to people that some someone they, they have a crisis at home uh, these are ex excellent examples where you could uh, make them understand that um, um, your life is more important than the work uh, and I value you more than uh, whatever we are doing at work. Uh, you always, you sort of go first for me, uh, and and you show up. You 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 sort of they they you make them feel that that uh, I understand you. There are there are occasions where they are not under pressure, but you are at you know under pressure at work. Uh, and if if they know when they need you, uh, you are there. Uh, they will be there for you when you need them for the say at work uh, and also personally but uh, it, it tends to be sort of as a leader you tend to they, they tend to be there for you very much if you they know you're always there for them when when they need it so that, that's, that's that's just one example it's um yeah pe people are uh, super i think loyal if you are loyal to them uh you know you you, you get it all back 10 times what you give absolutely okay that's a brilliant example and I also talk about that with the leaders, my clients, that to, to have people show up for you, you really need to show up for them. And yeah. also it's about building that trust really. And, and you as a leader, you're not there to, to lead only. For me, that is a lot about serving your team. You are there as a servant. You are not this guy who is pointing with a hand or with a finger. You do this, you do that. It's more about being that person who is saying, hey, I have the authority, I have the power. How can that help you? How can I help you do your job in a good way, feel good and so on. And, and it's really great how you're showing the, by example that you're really pushing your people first and they know that, okay, I can come to Joachim and say, hey, I have troubles at home and I can't deliver. And they know that you will be there for them. You will make it work out. You will find a solution together how to go through that period. And that's really great to, to show that. Yeah, that, yes, yes. But it, but it could also be small things. It could be just at work as well that, uh, you know, there, there is some reason that someone, um, they, 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 just try to be be understanding and, and uh and, and not just uh, ask for the moon, really, when uh, there are circumstances that uh, is out of their control, uh, happens quite often. Uh, and, and then, uh, you know, what, what, uh, because there are, there are people who are, I'm very results oriented, uh, but uh, I, I still always, you know, I, I know, uh, you know, I, uh, I set high goals and uh, I don't in, in a way care if I reach them. Uh, but but it's, it's just a stretch for me. But then I, I'm there. But the people are slaves under their goals. That's not me. Uh, but but I, uh, I I put a stretch goal there uh, because it's sort of fun to have. Uh, but it, it, it's it's not something that I, I feel bad that I didn't reach really. Uh, I, I'll do my best uh, rather. And and I, I think that goes with my sort of people in my team as well that they they put stretch goals as well and they know that uh, something could come up which was sort of unfortunate that we didn't foresee and then things doesn't happen that then you don't ask the moon from them in that situation that's another example where as a leader you are um, 
you're not too demanding. You, 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 so it's, it's, it's always about, I think, both. Uh, I, I, I can be very demanding because I'm not demanding. If you see what I mean, <laughs> it's kind of uh, complicated, but it's, uh, I I, yeah, I, I give them the slack. They know that, uh, let's just have a, have, have the best go at it. Uh, so I, I, I get people who are motivated and, uh, they're motivating for the, the task itself. Uh, they, they, and, and they have a lot of authority of, uh, running with their own task. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't micromanage at all. Um, I, I, and I, but I don't, I, I'm a little bit, the way I work a little bit is sort of that I, as, as a leader, you know, I, I have my lead, leadership team, but, and, and somewhere, you know, because I was a chairman of the company for eight years in Crunchfish, and I, just the last year, I stepped in in a role as a CEO, and I, one thing I surprised some people is that I, I took decisions uh, as the CEO, but not asking the, the, the management team, mm -hmm. and, and some people thought that was kind of weird, because they felt, oh, aren't we a team, and I said, well, I expect you to do your task in your area. And, and you, 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 I won't be your sort of, you know, I won't be there all the time for you. Uh, I, I will be there if you ask me, but I, 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 I've hired you or you are here because I think you are better than me in this area. So I'll trust your judgment, just run with it. You don't have to ask me really. If you feel you have to ask, well, come ask me. But uh, otherwise don't, please don't, because uh, I have too much to do. But likewise, don't expect me uh, to sit and uh, hold your hand uh, in the areas which are my responsibility because I'm responsible for the company and I'll take decisions on my own. Mm -hmm. I won't ask you. And, and, and it's kind of, they felt a little bit, I know some people who are used to more of a consensus leadership uh, in the management team. And I say, well, I, sorry, that's not how I do it uh, because I feel I have authority to do things which sort of is my responsibility. And I, if I need your, your advice, I'll ask you, but please don't expect me to do that all the time. And I, they've gotten used to it now, but it was a little bit in the beginning that they felt I was, uh, oh, I thought I was in the management team. I say, yeah, you are in the management team, but that doesn't mean that you do my job. I'll do my job, please do yours. I love this example, but because it is so not Swedish, <laughs> if you really know. talk stereotypes, right? Have you always been like this, Joachim? I, I don't know, uh, but I learned over the years, I'm sort of, you know, I'm 55, so I'm a bit older. Uh, so I'm, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I find um, right now, I, uh, one of the things that if you get older, uh, time flies, it, it goes faster and faster. I don't have time and we have so much to do. So this would go too slowly. I, I, I believe in speed uh and and this, we have we have so much to do so this will just slow us down that i have to sit and uh, consult with everybody i i will consult if i need if, if i feel i can't um if, if i can't sort of uh take the decision myself i i'll give you one good example i learned this actually as um you know uh, in sweden um i'm old enough that everybody did military service uh now it, it's not mandatory anymore but it used to be and um uh, and, and I remember the major, uh, or they, uh, at that, he was the head of the regiment, really. And he said to us, uh, I am the head, sort of here. Uh, this is on first day. Uh, and he told everybody, he was then the leader there. And he said, uh, if, you, if you want to ask, come and ask for approval, you come to me. And I'll tell you straight away, I always say no. <laughs> All right, we thought, okay. Yeah, he said, because if there is something you want to seek my approval for, it's some sort of, I don't know, something you want to do that you can't take responsibility for yourself. So you come to me and you expect me to take responsibility for something you don't want to take responsibility for. And of course, I will never do that. Never. So I will always say no. And we said, okay, so what should we do here? Uh, but then he said with a smile that, but if you feel that you absolutely have to ask, so come after lunch, he said, because it has happened that I've said yes. Um, and I learned two things from, from that. Um, one, which there was a great advice. I think that one is that if you feel you can do this, uh, take the responsibility yourself, just do it. Mm -hmm. You know, don't ask anyone, you know, you, you, um, you answer to yourself. Uh, if you feel that this is something you can do, no need to ask for any anybody else uh, and, and I do that as a leader but I also try to get everybody to see it that way don't ask me 
Um, well, I, I don't tell them I, I'll say no to anything, but uh, I, I, I want them to be as independent they, they just can be. So I am, uh, I don't want to dump things on them, but I, I really seriously want to delegate to them. Uh, and you can run with your area. Uh, and I run with mine. But the other thing you learn is sort of, uh, you're always sort of selling something. You're, you're peddling something as an entrepreneur all the time. And you learn that never ever, particularly with men, don't call them at 11.30 before lunch because they're cranky. Uh, they will say no, even for a good decision. But it has happened quite often that if you call them at two, if they've had a good lunch, they say yes to even a crappy decision. So uh, in selling, just do that after lunch. That's, that, that was a fantastic advice. You got that the first day from the leader from that uh, in my military service. I, I, I've, you know, I, I served 15 months, but I, to be honest with you, I could have just done that day. I, I, <laughs> I was done. I got all the advice I needed. That's a brilliant example. And uh, what a great advice. And really, the, you, you know, this books think fast, think, think slow, right? And there is a lot of research showing that our brains are crankier and we take worse decisions when we're hungry. So that's really good <laughs> advice for every leader listening out to us. Uh, <laughs> go and ask. If you need to ask for something, go and ask after lunch. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but preferably don't ask. Um, why don't you start? Uh, because the, 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 I, I think just you, we have extremely competent people. You know, they live very complicated lives. So, you know, it's, it's uh, life is not easy, uh, and and they have families and they take a lot of decisions and they can do a lot of things. Why why start to you know become a baby at work? Why why don't you continue being an adult and, and sort of just stand up and do your things really? And uh, so I'm. You know, um, we, we have a very flat organization and, uh, and I allow everybody to just run with it. We coordinate just um, uh, just once a week. Uh, I, I, I'll ask everybody to write. Uh, we have a little bit of a, a tool. Uh, everybody asks, answers three questions. That's sort of, I guess, a, a bit of a practical advice. I just ask what, what's happened last week? What are you going to do next week? And is anything in the team you need help with mm -hmm. uh, from the rest of the team? And we, we tend... And I, I, I start a meeting at 10, but I, 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 I don't start it actually at 10.15 because I want everybody to have that 15 minutes, if not sooner, to read what everybody else has read. And then we, even if we have a team of sort of 10 people in that, or I don't know, eight people in our management team, we, we, we tend to focus on um, what you need help with. Uh, and everything else people have read. Um, I don't ask any of my, um, you know, I, I do a monthly report to the board because they're not here. Uh, and, and some of the, the people in my team, they ask, oh, oh, do you want us to write a monthly report? I say, no, you don't have to. Um, if, if there is something happening in your area, uh, which is, I don't know about because of this sort of weekly routine we have, it's not worth telling the board about. Uh, so you don't have to. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll write um, one page to the board where, where I really summarize it. In. And if you have a detail I wasn't aware of, it wasn't worth putting in the board, board's notes anyway. So please don't uh, write anything. So let's not wait any time on those kind of, uh, you know, I don't know what, why people do it really, just to feel more secure, I guess. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm not too much for security. I'm more for speed. And this is something I actually wanted to, to ask you or, and go deeper because I, what I hear is that you are very confident in both you and your team. You have the Ooh. trust that is really building on the confidence like we are here all for a reason. We got this job for, for a reason because we, we are supposed to be good at it and let's run with it. So where does that come from? And I would guess that like the second part of the question, I would guess that not everyone on your team comes with that sort of belief in themselves and like self-confidence and trust to the team. How do you work with that? Um, well, I, I think it is, again, that's part of leadership. I think it, it, it comes, the culture is, um, the, you know, the top uh, is, is important for the culture, the, the culture you set. And, and, and people tend to, they, they learn, they, they see what's happening and then what's going on and they, they adapt. Uh, and I don't think that's too difficult, actually. People start adapting to it. Uh, sometimes you just, you know, we, we did have, uh, we needed that because uh, I heard when I took over as a CEO that some people were uncomfortable. How could you start a, a, an office up in Stockholm? Uh, because we had one employee uh, sort of remote in Stockholm. How could you do that without asking us in the management team? And I thought, well, 
yes, get over it. Uh, that, that's, you know, we have a new person in Stockholm and why can't I open an office in Stockholm? Why, why should I ask you about that? That's not your responsibility. That's sort of a corporate decision. I'll take that. Uh, and, and just, and, and, and they, they understand how, how I cope with that. And I, I think that uh, just, um, you just have to, sometimes you have to take a step back and, and, and look at uh, sort of the form uh, or the process or how you work and 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 they had to discuss that up front uh, and I did that when that happened because uh, I heard that from the previous year that well people are starting to be a bit uncomfortable and you don't want to lose them I said well I, I don't think I will lose them but I, I'm happy to describe or de explain uh, how I see you about things because I, I as I said I, I put a lot of trust in my people and uh, I, I want them to run with their things but likewise I think they need to put trust in me Mm -hmm. um uh, because i it, it goes both ways um uh, i trust them and i expect them to trust me doing my role uh so it, that's how you start to get get into that uh, i'm um i also think it's possible if you have a strong culture so i think we have at our company uh that you uh, then that, that helps in getting people to uh, blend in uh, into that uh because i you know we are we, we don't have many people leaving a, a company at all. I, I think I've been here now since 2012 uh, and the, just last year in, in really uh, as a CEO before I was, but I was, a, I was an executive chairman. So I was here quite often. I, I still handle some of the tasks in the company, but um, then we had a CEO. Uh, our split was, I, he did um, business as usual. Uh, and I told him anything which is unusual, which is easy sometimes in a fast growing company, you can leave that with me. So I, I did business as unusual. Uh, he could do business as usual. But then it tend, turned to, one of the things that we started up with was all this with the digital cash and uh, all our ideas. That was an unusual thing that we did, but that turned out to be the big thing in the company. And I said, now is better. Now, now that is business as usual. Uh, what used to be unusual. So uh, it's better I take over now. And, uh, and I'm very happy he stayed on. So he, he's now my sort of... Uh, you know, uh, COO of the company, handling still many of the same thing he did before, okay. uh, still handling the gesture control that we did as well, that he's handled all along, uh, that's still on him. But uh, this area, which I built as an unusual thing, um, which dominates the company now, then um, yeah, it, it just was making more sense that I, I sort of took over. And, and then in came a little bit my then culture, uh, because as a leader, I think you set a little bit of the tone, uh, yeah, in the company as well, but but he his spirit is still here. He's more uh, he's a great I think uh, we, we're, we're quite different. Um, he's he's much more uh, managerial than I am. Uh, I'm more leader. Uh, he's more managerial. But I think we're a good match because you need both things really. Uh, I'm quite happy he, he that he that he does a lot of the managerial stuff, you know. Uh, so I, I can focus on uh, leadership. And, uh, and also working quite hard, actually, with a lot of uh, operational details that uh, is needed right now to be, uh, yeah, to push this uh, big area of ours, uh, digital cash into the world. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a huge task. And uh, I'm, yeah, I feel yeah, I'm quite busy with that. But it's, uh, it's busy in a fun way. So I don't mind. It's, a, it's definitely a very big area that is really taken over, and especially this year. And you did a series or a several series of the interviews, right, with different stakeholders, which I really loved how you were interviewing your board of directors and then different employees in different areas. And then also you had this alumni uh, series where you interviewed the previous empl employ employees of yours. I really love the spirit. And as we discussed in the, in the chat with you, you said, like, if you watch any of those interviews, you, you feel this spirit that we are quite a special company. And it's really like that. And in the pre-chat, I told you, like, I feel that in the way you support your alumni, right? You showcase the companies they went for, that they left uh, Crunchfish for, for example, and you just have really good relationship. And I, I see it more and more in the startup world, and it's really warming up my heart to see these kind of relationships that you really build relationships for, for life. And even if you're not their employer anymore, you still keep in touch, you, you follow up what's going on in your world and those kind of things. And it's really inspirational to see that and it's um, I'm really grateful for for the series that you've made that you actually not only covering the tech details but also the relationship building and there I want to touch onto this uh, your relationship with different stakeholders because sure. you are a listed company you have a board of directors to report to you 
you you have different people and their interests or different groups right and their interests how did that how do you think that changes the environment for you as a leader and your responsibilities um i, I didn't quite get your question i, I understand that yeah i there's there's stakeholders all over the place. Um, I understand, but what, what, what was your question again? How, how it has changed or? Uh... Well, the thing is that basically you have the board of directors, right? So there are people who are investing in the company. What I'm thinking about, there are people who are starting the business and they just take their own money and they try to build the business that way. You do have some kind of external support, right? The investors, even though you, you are part of the that investing. Uh, I'm, I'm the main owner. Uh, so I'm, yeah. I'm sort of, uh, I, I do have in this company quite a lot of hats because I'm, I'm, I'm the biggest owner. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm the only one, and that's what I meant with my question, that you have other owners who have put their money in. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it, yeah, it, it, we, 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 we're way past that right now because we are, uh, we are, Crunchyish has about 4,000 owners because mm -hmm. we are a listed company. We are a public company. Um, and, um, but, but we, we have a very loyal uh, sort of owner base. I, I personally probably know the 20 largest owners, personally, mm -hmm. all of them. Uh, may, may, no, it's actually come in some, some I, I've seen some that have come in uh, as fairly large owners um, that I don't know. Uh, but but I, I say I, I know 19 out of 20 of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and they've been part of us, you know, we, I, I came in as their, the very first investor into this company. I didn't found it, it was, uh, our CTO founded it in 2010. Uh, I was there, you know, a seed investor in 2012, became the chairman. And uh, we've done a, a few rounds, financing rounds, three or four or five, not five, four or five, I think, financing rounds. But then we did IPO in 2016. Um, and then you need to spread the ownership. Uh, and, and we've been on the stock market uh, for uh, four or five years. So it's, um, I think that's a, a pretty important undertaking because then you are, uh, you know, as soon as you, if, if you start a company, you own 100% yourself, you can do what you want. But as soon as you have a, a, just one other uh, person uh, who is a part owner, uh, you, you, you have to realize that it's not your company anymore to 100%. So it's not, you, you, have, to, uh, you, you have to be considerate and fair and, and all that. Uh, I love going in, I love in a way the, the stock market how it works because uh, I'm a little bit allergic to venture capitalists because they, they send you 50 pages of agreements that you have to sign and uh, they, they have all the rights. Uh, they own maybe 20% of the company, but they, they, they give themselves superpowers uh, as investors. Uh, I never liked that. Uh, so I, I think the, the stock market is much more fair because uh, one, one share, one vote uh, is, is sort of a, and no, no rules, special rules are allowed, uh, which is really cool, I think. So I, I like the, the, the um, democracy of a, uh, of uh, being a sort of a public company in that sense. So how, how did the going public or like having the IPO change or did it change anything for how you actually run the Crunchfish? Of course, then you were not the CEO, but you were still quite active as a- uh, we, we, we had to change some routines. Uh, we, we, before we were just sort of, uh, I think we had about 10, 10 shareholders. And we, um, in addition to have, um, uh, you know, board meetings as well. We, we actually had a, um, we had a monthly um, lunch actually, where we, we, we board lunch, uh, because one of, one, of, one, of the, one of the challenges if, if you are, uh, one of the challenges you need to, if, if you have a board, if you just start there, if you have a board, if you want them to be helpful, you, they need to have information uh, because you can easily as a CEO, you can easily, you know, bypass them because you, you certainly have so much more information of what's going on and, uh, and, and you can keep them in the dark and, and they are, they're really of no use to you at all. But if you, there, there is a challenge for you is, is so how do you make sure that uh, board members uh, can be effective to you? Um, and you need to basically keep them in, in the loop. So we, we, we had once a month uh, a lunch uh, we, I think we just call it the board lunch, uh, but it was also, we invited also uh, all the shareholders as well. Uh, and, and, and we did that uh, on a regular basis too. And it was just lunch, uh, but we, we, we talked about what was going on and everybody felt informed. But you're not allowed to do that. Uh, you can do it with the board, I guess, but the five shareholders that were not on board are not, uh, we, we couldn't keep them you know, without privileged information, uh, being a listed company, 
because so uh, being listed means that uh, the market needs to get critical information at the same time mm -hmm. uh you you really have to uh that's market regulations uh because otherwise people are getting insider information in a way that uh yeah it, 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 there are very strict rules around the, all these things so um that habit uh had to stop uh you, we, i guess we can still do it with the board uh uh but um uh, the whole habit actually died. I think it's still a good idea to do with the board, but but, but we actually stopped doing it when um, when we went public. Um, what what we what other thing that changed is that we we, we sort of had to um, the guy who was our auditor, sort of he, he's sort of a certified auditor. He became our CTO, mm -hmm. a CFO instead, Chief Financial Officer, uh, and then we had another auditor, um, and and that was because you really as a public company you want you you don't want to make any mistakes in terms of how you report your numbers because that is just you don't want to you know embarrass yourself with that and and he's super you know uh, he he was our auditor before and now he's uh, consulting to to us uh, as a uh, as cfo and and the other thing the other role you have to have is is basically an uh, investment relation uh, a marketing communications person and so we we had to, so these two roles i think you need to if you, if you don't really are strong in these areas you need to uh you need to fix that but if you have two two people one who takes care of the financing so that's really always strong and and one that is uh, the um, sort of communication slash investor relations person you're fine mm -hmm. um then, then you can work with that uh that's the major change that you have to do to be super uh, tight in these areas otherwise uh you set yourself up, set yourself up for failure otherwise yeah that's a great piece of advice just to be like keep your eyes on those uh, areas that are important and really have the control of your numbers and relationship and yeah you... and, and comply with the market regulation rules which is the ir person's uh, yeah the, the the investment relation person would be uh, understanding what's required and uh, it's a little bit i wouldn't say policeman but but they, 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 they know what's uh, because there are there are, you, you there are some procedure you have to follow which you don't have to follow if you're if you're a private company yeah there are regulations and extra re uh, requirements coming or responsibilities when you go do the apo yeah yeah but uh, you it looks like you're managing it really great and I really like the visibility of your company of Crunchfish, just how you keep it informal in a way, like light. So it's it's just enjoyable to watch. I, I would Thank say. You. And the other question I would like to, or the topic I would like to cover with you a bit, Joachim, is the uh, cross culture communication and really having finding synergies in having people from different backgrounds because you have quite a big. Oh, part of the company in India. And this is quite a different culture from Swedish. So how do you leverage on that instead of having that as some kind of roadblock? Yeah, I, I, I think I've never had a problem, actually. I, I think that's as a leader sort of, or as a person, that's one of my strengths. I think that I can relate to, I can talk to professors, I can talk to uh, business leaders, I can talk to uh, politicians or I can talk to other cultures and I can talk to children and I I, 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 I sort of tend to it, it doesn't matter who I talk to I, I tend to um, talk to them in I, I try to envisage what how should I talk to you so I you know uh, it, it fits your uh, your style in a way so I uh, you know um, I, I think I even do it with uh, my dialect uh, I, I'm one of those that say if, if I at, at least sort of in Swedish, if I start to talk to someone from Stockholm, I, I have started to have a Stockholm dialect. If someone from Gothenburg, I, I, I slide over to that. So I'm, I'm a little bit um, a camelont uh, in, in, in that sense. Uh, in terms of culture, um, I, I, I had an, a training or I had an experience because I, I was at Ericsson before, uh, as many Swedes in the tech area has been. So I, I was working in uh, Malaysia. And I, I had a 15 people working for me. Uh, I was the regional director for South Asia for one of the business areas in Ericsson. This was back in the uh, in the 90s, actually mid 90s, uh, so a long time ago. But I um, I had uh, 15 people uh, from 14 different countries, which was extremely diverse. Uh, so I, I started to think about what what does this mean, uh, and I, I came across a book. Uh, it was written by a guy, his name is Fons Trompenars, uh, and it's called Riding the Waves of Culture. Uh, 
Mm. And um, it, it, it was quite useful for me to just be exposed because it, this is how it is with people that, you know, or with culture that, you know, uh, you and me, Anna, we, we sort of look the same. Uh, and and you, you can assume that, well, Anna, she's probably like me. But um, uh, if, if you, what Fons Trompenos did in that book is that if, if they, you put virtues against each other, you know, I, I'm sure you would agree with me that honesty is important. Uh, everybody does that. Mm -hmm. and, and friendship, uh, is that important? And you say, yes, it's important. But what happens if you put friendship against honesty? Uh, and that's what Fons Trumpenas found out that he because he, he put people in you know he gave them dilemmas and one dilemma is this sort of that uh, you're in a car with your friend your friend's driving and he's he's going too fast and there is an accident so the question is to you this becomes a court case can your friend expect you to lie for him in court that he wasn't speeding and um that, that, that question uh, tells a little bit about the culture. Uh, so we are actually extremes uh, in Sweden because we put honesty above everything. Uh, so we, you know, we wouldn't lie. Um, and uh, if you are more from Southern Europe or if you even go to Southeast Asia, th they value friendship. Uh, I, I'm not saying what's right or wrong here. I, I'm just saying that they, they stand up for their friend uh, and, and Swedes don't. We, because we have to tell the truth. Um, and, and, uh, and again, um, that's how we are. Uh, we, we sell out our friends <laughs> uh, for truth, uh, but they wouldn't do that. Uh, and, 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 it is, and, and what Fr Fons has done is, is asked sort of, uh, I don't know, it's 40 different nationalities about uh, how they will respond to that question. And they put it all on a bar chart. Swedes are, I think 95% of Swedes would say, no, if this is a court case, I'll tell the truth. Uh, so the friend, only 5% of uh, you, you, have, you have to look hard to find a Swede which will set up for your friend. Uh, but likewise, in I think it was Thailand, uh, it was probably 10% of the Thais would tell the truth. 90% would, yeah, I'll stand up for my friend. But it, it was an interesting twist with this sort of, uh, this, uh, this question and that was, if you now heard that the cyclist that, uh, that your friend hit, he died. So how would you respond now? And, and what's interesting is that that polarizes the whole uh, thing. Now Swede says, I have to tell the truth. Now it's not longer 95, it's 99% of the Swedes would tell the truth. It's probably yes, an outlier 1% who would stand up for the friend. But this is a matter of life and death. I can't live with myself not telling you the truth. But likewise, if you're from, say, if, if, you, if your culture has the other, other virtue higher, holds that higher, like in saying, we take Thailand again, it's probably just a few percent of the Thais who wouldn't stand up for the friend in that case, because then now the friend really needs help. You cannot say no. Uh, so it's, it, the whole bar chart actually uh, polarizes, which was quite interesting. Uh, so he, he does a lot of these things. And I, I learned a lot about that. Uh, the culture is, is about something underneath the, the surface. You, you may think people are the same, but they're not. And, and it's, um, it, it all comes out when you're, you're putting those virtues against each other. And, and, the, and, you could, um, and, and having that understanding helps you. Uh, to relate to people because they're all good people. They just have different uh, preferences when it comes to virtues. Mm. Yeah, that's a very inter interesting perspective. And like, I'm reflecting on that because I'm from Ukraine myself. And I could imagine that we are more on the protect the friend side, mm. but I would be on more on the Swedish kind of side myself. And I wonder whether it stems in or roots into the trust to the system which is huge in sweden mm -hmm. and in southeast asia for example and uh, south uh, europe and so on it is more bureaucracy and corruption or more corruption let's say that affects the trust of people to the system and the government so there it's like okay if i don't protect my friend <laughs> then the friend is screwed because the system is not functioning <laughs> Yeah. So, but he gave, an, he gave another example as well. I, I can give you that, which is interesting because now we, we're polarizing this decision less. And this is, you're a food critic. So you write reviews for uh, a magazine about restaurants. 
and you, you come to a restaurant, uh, you, you don't really like the service and the food wasn't that great. But when you were going to write this article, you find out this is your friend, your old friend from high school, your best friend who is sort of owning this restaurant. So now is the question, can your friend, your old friend, can, they, can, they ex can he or she expect you to write a better review? Mm. Now, this is not as such an important decision for Swedes. So now the Swedes would be mm, probably 70% would say, no, 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 this is my professional job. I'll tell the truth. But we, it's up to 30% who will actually stand up for the friend. Mm. But likewise in Thailand, uh, it's, now it's only, you know, 30% of the Thais will say, no, 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 this is my job and I, this is not so important for my friend. So the, everything collapses here. Uh, so it's not, uh, so it's, but, but, but still, we have the virtue of honesty. So we are still siding more on that side. And then the, uh, if, if you have more friendship, you're still siding more there. It was, it was, it's one cool twist on this one was that there was one outlier country where it went completely, uh, you know, to the uh, extreme, and that was the French. Okay. And, and, and it's all, it all follows the theory because, uh, because in France, food, you know, that's a matter of life and death. That, that's it's, it's sort of, so because they are on, on that side, they're not, it wasn't so poor important with the court case, but when it came to food, 99% of the French would not lie about something as important as food, which was kind of fun to see. Uh, but but it's all, it's, it's the same thing that uh, they are more on the truth side than on the friend side. But when it came to such an important thing as food, mm, mm -hmm. no lying there. It all makes sense. It just all aligns to, to how you observe the cultures. But okay, you had this experience and you, you've had a lot of diversity in, in your team. And how is it in a crunch fish? Did you have to help your employees somehow find this common ground, create the curiosity about each other, or has it just been working naturally for, for all crunch fishers? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I think I just, um, I don't spend too much time on that. I, I, I just do, in a way, uh, and, and they, uh, because you, you set a lot of the culture from the top, I feel, uh, so I, I just do, and I, you know, they, they see how I do it. And, and, and I think that's, um, uh, then they know what's allowed. I think that that's why, that's why how it's, um, uh, I think a lot of the culture is created from the top because they, they understand that that's actually allowed to do. And then uh, some people it comes natural for them. Some takes it a little bit slower, but I don't mind. People can be different. Uh, people can do it in their style. Not everybody has to be, a, you know, a, a, you know, copy of me. I'm, that's not what I'm asking. So they, they, they can have their, you know their way of doing things that's fine um but but i but but i think we are all about um achieving something as a team um uh, where i i value individual excellence uh that you can run with your stuff just do it uh but i also value team performance mm. so 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 for me it's sort of uh it, it, it's, it's it's a bit of both you I, I value individual excellence and team performance uh, at the same time uh, so you can be everybody can be Slatan Ibrahimovic if they want to in my in my team, but uh, but 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 also uh, in some sense they can't be it because uh, you uh, you everybody we are a team uh, because we are much stronger as a team. But but you can be a, a star. Everybody can be a star. Uh, I, I sort of view it a little bit that everybody has the same job. We just have different. Uh, different sort of uh, realms. Uh, I, my, realm, my, my sort of remit is to develop the company uh, and have that. Someone has the, the, you know, the head of India, he has my job, but uh, in India. Uh, and, and someone who is in uh, marketing communication, he has my job, but in marketing communication. And so it's, it's just different, uh, it's just different scopes, but uh, you know, you just run with it. And that's why I don't, uh, yeah, I, that's how I see, uh, that's how I view the world. I don't see different, I just see that we have different scopes, uh, different focus really, but otherwise uh, I allow everybody to have the authority sort of on me, uh, wherever they are. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. That's really great. Do you feel like anyone is uncomfortable with this authority level that you're giving them? No, no. I think they like it uh, because they feel, I, I think if you, if you, I think that's probably in leadership the most important thing you, you want to do because, it, you know, if, if you have people who are, uh, I, I really believe that if you've got to get people to perform uh, only for 
very mechanical tasks, you, you can reward people with money. Mm -hmm. uh, you, 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 can, you can give them more carrots and then, then they work a little bit faster if they just have extremely sort of mechanical tasks. But any cognitive skills uh, involved, uh, anything sort of with a little bit, you, you're not motivating with money. Uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's, I think there's even science around that. But, but you motivate by what people feel uh, uh, that they have a meaningful job, they have a lot of autonomy and they have control and, and all that. that. That's when you get people to, blossom and uh, perform at their, uh, you know, I, I think you had this, uh, how do you get people to perform at their genius level? I think that was your first approach to me. And I, mm -hmm. I said, well, uh, I, I don't think I really responded to you, except that I, you know, uh, I think we're quite fine, thank you. Uh, we, we do that. <laughs> and, and I think that one of the ways to do that is actually to allow a lot of freedom to people. And, and, and people are, you know, they're adult people. They, they manage their very complex life outside. Why couldn't they manage it at the work? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's great to have this trust. Actually, I, I want to roll back to five minutes ago in the conversation and uh, you talk about culture comes from the top that you as a leader really set the tone and show that this is how we function here as a team together. To our listeners who might not be that part of that top, maybe middle management or engineers, uh, what could you suggest to them? They are not the ones who can set the tone for the whole organization, the whole department, whatever. What can those people who are interested in creating a more thriving culture in their organization, but they don't have this pondus, as you say in, in Sweden, um, the authority, what could they do to create? But, but they can set it, they, they can, you, you always have the, so the ways I see this that, uh, because I, I, I remember I, I said that uh, when I was with Ericsson, I said that to the head of, uh, I think he was the head of the whole business area. I told him, we, I, I believe that. I told him we have the same job you and me. Uh, it's just that I have a smaller responsibility area. And you can create that, that trust and that way of working in your area. Uh, so you, you, you are the top of that area. So you, 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 you know, I, I appreciate that it helps if it goes all the way, even uh, above you. But uh, if you lead by example yourself in your own area, then um, uh, I, I guess if someone would object strongly to that who is above you, maybe you want to move. Uh, to another place where you are more conducive to an open and uh, and, and good place to work, uh, because I think yeah, life's too short uh, to work at you know crappy places. Uh, move on then, uh, but but uh, you could create it if if I think a lot of I actually think that uh, a lot of people would allow uh, people to because this is about taking responsibility yourself, being a leader. People want. I think in all organizations, just like I want the whole team, everybody to step up, to, to lead uh, as well. Yeah, you follow, so you, you sort of do it, you know, you follow and you lead, you follow and you lead, but you do both things. I, I want them to lead in their area. So, uh, and, and I, again, uh, I, I would think a leader in, in any organization, if, if they wouldn't like someone who took initiative, uh, who was proactive, who was driving their area, who wouldn't like that kind of employee? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so just take charge. Uh, and if you don't have anyone uh, that, if, if you have the luxury of not have, having anyone that you have to lead, being responsible for, that you are sort of, if you don't, yeah, you, you, you're basically not a manager for anyone. Lead yourself, you know, be that person. Uh, and, and then uh, things will go well for you. I, I, I really think so. Uh, I, I think it's... Um, you know, um, be a high energy person, uh, take breaks so you can, you know, uh, I believe in uh, high energy, but then also uh, value those uh, in between times because you need to rest as well. You can't just be high energy all the time. So value your balance uh, and, and, but, uh, you know, be there. Um, just, you know, I, I, in a way this, no one will stop you. Uh, just be your best. <laughs> I love that Joachim. Basically, be the CEO of your life and your area, whatever the area is. Yeah. It can be really tiny and can be a huge organization, but be the CEO of that. Take charge of that, and that will create the ripple effects around you. Yeah, I think so. I, I think it. You know, I, I'm not leader of the world in any way, <laughs> but but I uh, but I do my best from my horizon. And, and uh, the more people who and there are a lot of people who's doing that. But just keep doing that. You know, do, do your best in your 
wherever you are and you, you're definitely the CEO of your own life. That's just what my major said at the, my regimen. You know, don't ask me, I'll say no, because if you don't want to say yes to yourself, why should I? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. So apart from that <laughs> beautiful lesson from your sur or surgeon or major, uh, what would be your three pieces of advice to our genius leaders, listeners? Oh, um, three, yeah. Uh, I, I guess summarize a little bit what we said. I, I think sort of be, uh, uh, yeah, I, I guess. be courageous, uh, you know, be, uh, take charge, uh, on your own life and your own uh, task and, um, you know, do that, be courageous and take charge, uh, be present, um, you know, really be present, not just, uh, not just put in your shoes there, be present, be there, see people and uh, interact with people, be there. Um, and then, um, you know, um, being present means being, uh, having empathy and an understanding and, uh, and, and I guess um, have fun, mm -hmm. you know, uh, life's too short not to have fun so let's try to have that so have fun be courageous and uh, be present be there for people I don't know it's a you know it's a, mix a great summary I think it's a great summary but I would also like to add one question here the practical tip what could our listeners do today after listening to this episode that can help them step like make a next step on this journey towards genius leadership that they can do yeah what can you do? Uh, um, one thing I did once um, was um, because I'm, I'm an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur, and I think everybody benefits from an entrepreneurial thinking and entrepreneurship is all about, we're building systems. That's what entrepreneurs do. Uh, and we're good at building those systems. So we achieve a lot of things with we, we, the output of what we achieve or what, what we achieve is much less than the input. We, we create such systems. And you can create it for yourself or you can create it for um, an organization, but, but that's the entrepreneurial mindset. And, and um, one, this was sort of, a, I'll give you a story that uh, I, I was triggered by, um, I, there was a girl who taught me how to do Zumba dancing, mm -hmm. uh, so, which I did for a while. Uh, and, and she went to uh, the supermarket uh, and um, straight after a class and she came there her hair was just in complete uh, disarray uh and the male uh, servant said oh uh, i like your hair and she said why why do you say that uh it, it's sort of i haven't sort of you know done my hair no but i like it like that that rough he said and and for a man to say that it's a little bit of a risk to do that to a woman that you have never met you know you could be a slap on your face so he he takes a little bit of a risk but she really got you know he saw her and he she got really quite happy mm -hmm. and uh, I, I 10 years later I asked her if I could use that story because I think it's uh, I said to her do you remember it yes she said I'll remember this one for the rest of my life so he took a little bit of a risk here to give a surprise compliment to mm -hmm. yeah you know, it could be to anyone to, to a woman here so he little risk you know that that's the cost of the whole situation a little risk but a, a great reward something that she would treasure for the rest of her life mm -hmm. and I, I i sort of said as an i thought this as an entrepreneur let me put that on facebook uh, i call it a surprise compliment mm -hmm. so i i asked everybody on my facebook yeah uh, this was 10 years ago or something why don't you go out and do a surprise compliment it could be it to someone you know or someone complete stranger but just mean it and and record what happened and, and uh, record also what happened with that person and what happened with yourself. How do you feel about it? And, and it was a fantastic day. Uh, it was just before Christmas. Uh, the first one who came in was a girl from Germany, from Berlin, I know. She went up to a street sweeper and she said, thanks for sweeping our streets. You are, you're doing such a great job. And the smile she got back from that street sweeper, she said, oh, it was so rewarding. Because, you know, and, and I, I would say as a tip, step out of your comfort zone, do something for another person, you know, be present, um, surprise them with your kindness, your love or whatever. Just do it. Just try it. I know it, it might feel awkward and uncomfortable, but I, it's going to be rewarding. Mm -hmm. So just try that and, uh, and then just keep going and you will have a good life. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> a beautiful tip you are giving. I'm tearing up actually for this story because I, I tried to do it myself. And just recently when we were coming back from Germany to Iceland, um, we were tested for COVID in, at the airport. And I, I had a chat with a guy who was doing the test for me. And uh, I said, thank you for, for what you do. And he just paused in the middle of the movement like, oh, thank you for saying that. It's not a lot of people who appreciate what I do here. And I was like, I'm pretty sure that quite a lot of people who are going through you, your booth here, are appreciating what you do. But it's just that not everyone maybe is expressing that. And it's so, also a stressful situation, someone is sticking into your nose. <laughs> so, he's a human being and he's, uh, he's you seeing him and you appreciating, and you telling him, it, it's so little, uh, especially now Nordic, Nordic countries where we're a little bit close, you know, we're a little bit sort of, uh, close because we are you know mountaineering people really but it, it's so easy to stand out uh, in, in our cultures and and you 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 it, it doesn't take much to be a, sort of a superhero when it comes to kindness in, in our, our, our culture take advantage of that <laughs> by by being kind and present and uh, surprise compliments is a cool thing actually and uh, it's uh, as an entrepreneur as i said i i built a system around it and i had a fun day i got i got about 50 people reporting mm -hmm. back uh, of just love stories for the whole day, which was a, was a great day. Oh, beautiful. So genius leaders, take this challenge from us and go and do the surprise compliment, make it, and maybe share your story as well with us and tag us so that we can actually learn and get inspired and get piece of that love as well. Joachim, thank you so much for the conversation and let us know how people can find you and learn more about you and the Crunchfish, connect with you when they want to get more of you. Yeah, I'm, I, well, I'm, uh, I'm all over social media. So uh, Facebook, you they find me at, or uh, LinkedIn, as it's probably my two sort of channels. And uh, yeah, my name and at Crunchfish, sort of, uh, yeah, or yeah, you know, so just, uh, just connect if you, uh, you know, want to know anything. So uh, I'll, I'll see you in the digital world or hopefully soon uh, after COVID uh, in the physical world. Yeah, let's hope for that. But yeah, I, I'm still preparing for a couple of more months of this. <laughs> yeah, sure. I will sure. Uh, put your resources in the show notes so that people can easily reach out to you. Thanks again for the conversation. It was really wonderful to have you over. No, thanks for a great chat, Anna. It was great. Thank you very much.